I'm Mohamed Balou, uh, part of Mab Labs Embedded Solutions, and we're going to talk about Zephyr and OpenAMP. And if you listen to my last two talks at FOSDEM and then last year's Zephyr Dev Summit, like a lot of this, a lot of these talks have been motivated by me being in close proximity to FPG engineers. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, the next iteration in that sort of kind of development process. I, I try to I try to claim to be an FPG engineer, but you know, like I, I stick I still stick to, stick to the embedded software side. Um, so just a quick agenda for today's talk. We're going to go over motivation behind what we're doing. We're going to talk a little bit about the OpenAMP overall framework and its relation to Zephyr. Um, the system architecture for the project that I worked on. Uh, that I mean, I had to change some things because uh, because it was a client-based project, but you know, the overall kind of framework and structure was similar. So we're going to talk about what that looked like, uh, the development process, and you know, this is not a, a Yocto class, but just because of the nature of the project that I worked on, like there, there were some Yocto bits, so we're kind of go over that in a slide or so. Um, some common issues and like the resolutions that I came up that I, I discovered. So you know, if you're also doing something with OpenAMP, that could be useful for you. And then kind of next steps to wrap it up. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an embedded software consultant. So I do a lot of design work. That includes all sorts of verticals from medical devices to custom ASICs, which is the motivation behind a lot of the talks that I've been doing with FPGAs. If you know anything about ASIC development, the first thing you generally do is prototype it on an FPGA. So a lot of my clients recently are like, hey, this Zephyr thing is cool. Uh, you know, we've been doing all of this stuff in FreeRTOS. Uh, can we try to do things with Zephyr? So a lot of this has been some, some relatively new things that I've been working on, um, and it's been the motivation for these talks. Um, you can uh, follow and uh, connect with me on my social media accounts. Um, that are listed down below. And then I have a newsletter that I distribute on a monthly basis. So if you want to sign up for it, you're welcome to. And you can find that on, on my website as well. So just a quick kind of summary about the motivation behind OpenAMP. Um, so we have nowadays a lot of heterogeneous multiprocessor systems. Um, and traditionally, they have been on distinct di silicon dice. So if you take the example of, let's say, a car, the automotive industry, you have different MCUs that are responsible for different kind of real-time subsystems. So you have an MCU that's responsible for brakes. You have an MCU, or they call it an ECU, responsible for like the shocks and suspensions, et cetera. Um, and then so they all communicate using like some common buses. So in, in the automotive industry, that's the CAN bus. We can use UART. We can use SPI or I2C. So a lot of these different controllers, let's say microcontrollers, um, they communicate over these kind of distinct buses. Um, and so you, in addition to a, a, an MCU that's responsible for some of the real-time components, you have an MPU that doesn't have any real-time requirements, but it's responsible, for example, in the automotive industry for the infotainment system. And again, they all have to kind of communicate over these pretty uh, popular, these common buses. But recently, right, uh, the silicon, as we all know, uh, silicon density has exploded pretty substantially. So you don't have like a single CPU or a single controller on the silicon itself. You actually have a lot more hardware that's stacked on, a, on an SOC, right? So this is an example of an NRF52840 um, SOC. And we can see that they have a radio subsystem, right, hardware to implement a radio subsystem, USB, um, all sorts of peripherals, and et cetera. And we can see that actually the, the core itself constitutes probably the least, one of the, the, few, the fewer uh, in terms of uh, silicon area. So nowadays, we have a lot more going on in our SOCs beyond just the CPU itself. So what we, as, as kind of an extension to that is we can add, like a lot more uh, silicon vendors now are adding microcontrollers and microprocessors onto a single die itself. So, you know, we, we have an extension here where it's like, okay, you have different peripherals on the die itself, but now you're adding multiple cores and multiple controllers themselves also on the SOC. So the advantage of that is we can kind of distribute the workload uh, of our application across the different microcontrollers and also even uh, multiple uh, MPUs as well. Um, so for example, like if, if you have an MCU that can be responsible for a lot of the real-time operations, going back to kind of like the automotive space. Uh, you know, the actual 
uh, components that are responsible to make sure that are safety critical. And then the MPU can be responsible for some of the non-real-time components. Uh, another application for this is robotics, uh, where you have, again, like the MCU responsible for actuation, and then the MPU can be responsible for like the GUI, display communication, things that are not real-time or safety critical components. Um, so for example, now, if we look at an SOC that's relatively modern um, and actually pretty modern and new, is we can see that we have multiple um, MCU cores or different types of cores and heterogeneous subsystems within a particular silicon uh, itself. So you have multiple kind of Cortex-A cores, for example, on the NXP IMX, IMX8 M+, in addition to like a hard DSP and a Cortex, uh, an ARM Cortex-M device. And then on the newest kind of NXP uh, SOC, the IMX95, we have actually multiple core M devices along with um, a core A device. So um, essentially, like we can start getting creative on how we want to take our application and how to distribute it uh, across our single silicon. And that kind of starts unifying a lot of uh, how we can think about how to distribute this workload and also how to manage uh, these different controllers. So for example, if you were at Embedded World last week, you saw this robot from Tordex and that had like uh, basically an, an IMX8 M plus um, uh, SOC from NXP. And then you had basically um, the, the MCU responsible for the motor control and the actuation on the robot itself. And then the A core, the Cortex A uh, uh, arm device uh, that's on the same silicon was responsible for like the GUI, the interaction and any sort of communication. So it's kind of an example um, of like, you know, what sorts of uh, capabilities you have on this, you know, relative, it's, it's a pretty small device, which is pretty cool, right? It, you know, as you can see, like somebody's leg is right there. So, you know, it's self-contained, it's pretty low power, et cetera, and, and physically small. Whoops. So, yeah, so what are the advantages of having this architecture where you have uh, microcontrollers and MPUs kind of all in a single uh, piece of silicon? Uh, we have increased speed and reduced latency, right? So that that's huge, right? We don't have to have, uh, relatively speaking, uh, the the for example, like between, um, let's say on let's say the ARM processors, right? Like you can use like actually direct interconnects within the silicon itself instead of having like like SPI, UART, et cetera. These are relatively speaking slower buses, so you have uh, much increased speed and reduced latency. Um, OTA becomes a lot more simplified, right? So again, all you need to do is you have some piece of memory that you're writing to, and then you can just dump your binary into that memory that's responsible for where the uh, the MCU is operating out of, essentially. And so that can, so you don't need to get creative. You don't need to kind of, you can start standardizing uh, the MCU firmware update process because if you're kind of all, let's say, on ARM cores, right, you have kind of the general framework about shared memory, between a Cortex-A, for example, and a Cortex-M, and then they're sh sharing kind of flash locations that are specific, then the Cortex-A can start marshalling uh, the, o the OTA process for the MCU for the uh, Cortex-M itself, for example. So that kind of framework or that kind of uh, mentality uh, led to the genesis of like this open app framework, uh, which you can find a lot of documentation on, on as a starting point on a GitHub uh, repo. There's multiple components to it and we'll get into in a little bit. We have, of course, the OpenAMP library. And so the, the two main components of it are the remote proc and the RP message. They're the core building blocks of this particular library. So remote, so these two components actually were originally committed to the Linux kernel by TI. Um, so what they, what, what they, the motivation for these, um, these implementations were essentially have allowing communication from between Linux and uh, TI RTOS, or what was then known as SysBio. So that was kind of the original motivation for TI starting this uh, framework. And then it got picked up by OpenEP, which turned into kind of this overall project and organization. And then they expanded what TI's work, uh, what TI started into a much more a comprehensive and extensive library and framework. So this is kind of uh, the overall motivation behind um, OpenEP in general. So we have essentially um, a single kind of uh, piece of memory that's essentially shared across, let's say, the different cores. We have the Linux uh, and their application that's running on the on the core A, uh, core, uh, the Cortex A, for example. And then we have, let's say, the RTOS and the bare metal implementations on the different Cortex M processes, right? So essentially, it's like this is all one big piece of silicon 
Um, and we're just kind of, we, we have to just be cognizant of how the different memories are distributed. So let's kind of dig into some of the, um, the actual applications and processes that are responsible or that kind of build up OpenAMP. So first we have remote proc. Um, and what that's responsible for is to start marshalling kind of writing or, or setting up the firmware on the MCU, for example. So one of the steps that it does is one of the first things that it does is parses the L file. Um, and so uh, that it, it's important for it to do that. So it, it, it's, so it's in, assured that it has the appropriate me memory segments that are to be loaded. And this is going to be kind of important later on as how this ties into Zephyr. Um, and so it loads a remote processor firmware. And then it also starts, essentially just kicks the MCU to kind of get it going. And then we have RP message, which is uh, the actual communication mechanism between. So, what, so once you use remote proc to basically load the firmware and get it going on the, on the Cortex-M, for example, RP message comes along and you can use that to essentially uh, communicate between, let's say, your Cortex-A MPU and your Cortex-M uh, MCU. And that's a very uh, well-defined format on how this message exchange occurs. So, uh, you know, you have this standard framework uh, to communicate between these uh, different cores. Um, two more kind of uh, uh, implementations of these overall uh, mechanisms is one is vert IO, so it kind of extracts ex abstracts out the inter the interprocess communication, um, and again, it uses kind of the shared memory region uh, between the processors, and then we have metal which is essentially the abstraction of the underlying OS uh, primitives that uh, OpenAMP uses to ensure like, you know, that all of the communication between your different processors um, are, 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 are efficient. Are, are, uh, they're not kind of just hogging, uh, like they're not just inefficiently implemented. So kind of just looking at, over, uh, now that we have kind of an overview of OpenAMP in general, we have remote proc, we have uh, RP message, and then we have metal. Um, so just kind of a quick overview of where they reside within Zephyr itself. So um, OpenAMP itself is an external repo that's part of the modules directory in, in Zephyr. Um, and then so we have the Zephyr implementation of OpenAMP, which is essentially um, uh, this resource table, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, and then there's an example that, you can, that I use as my starting point uh, in Zephyr, which is uh, under Sample, subsys, IPC, uh, open amp, uh, right, resource table. So that's, that was kind of the starting point that I used for kind of this particular effort. Um, and these are the relevant kconfig options. So config IPM is kind of enables the uh, open amp, um, the, the interprocessor kind of communication subsystem within the IPC subsystem within Zephyr. Uh, config open amp basically compiles the open amp subsystem. And then the resource table uh, config options essentially uh, enable kind of this resource table again because that's what that's one of the things that remote proc uses is it, it verifies that your elf file has that resource table entry um, to make sure that you know you, there is actually shared communication that the MCU is aware that oh they're like what that shared shared resource is so that it can communicate between uh, the MPU and the MCU so that's one of the first things that remote proc does is when you actually uh, and we'll see how that like how that loading process works is very straightforward. Um, one of the first things that there's, there's like a kernel module on the Linux side that kind of checks and parses the ELF file to make sure that it meets certain requirements. If it doesn't, it kind of throws errors. But if it does, um, it essentially just starts the process of loading that into the MCU. Um, and so it, it, one of the things that it does is it checks to make sure that this resource table entry uh, is present in your ELF file. And then also uh, we need to make sure that because we're kind of the slave in this uh, as part of the MCU, we need to disable the option uh, for to, to make sure that we're not the master in the open M configuration because it, it defaults to uh, a yes in Zephyr K config. Um, and this is uh, basically an example, in that same example that I, that I referenced earlier, uh, this is just the overlay for the board file that they're using, uh, which, which is a STM32 part. Um, and you know this is gonna be useful later on. So again, we can see that um, we define two things. We defined um, the IPC shared memory, right? We uh, reference that to uh, a region of memory uh, that's defined between the that's defined by the vendor uh, be, that that is shared between the MCU and the MPU, and then the IPC itself um, is a construct that we can kind of create and use that for the communication itself. And then 
we can use like uh, the, to which is typical in a lot of these multiprocessor uh, systems is we have this kind of mailbox uh, configuration. So this was kind of the basis for uh, what I did um, as part of this development effort. So kind of talking about the actual specifics of this project, and again, like I, I did it on a different piece of hardware because the hardware that was originally intended for the project was custom and proprietary. Um, so I wanted to kind of see uh, what I needed to do essentially to use like a commonly available like development board and then see how that kind of takes me, uh, how, how, how that progresses. So this was uh, essentially it's the same uh, sort of Xilinx product, um, but just on a different board by a different vendor. It's a Digilent uh, Genesis SU, uh, ZU. Um, it has a Zinc MP SOC. So that's essentially a quad core uh, Cortex A and then a dual core uh, Cortex R. So it's, it's not the Cortex M that we saw earlier in the early, earlier silicons. Um, this is a Cortex R, which is meant for kind of real time operations. So this is just a block diagram of the uh, of the specific um, controllers within the MP SOC. Um, so essentially, we have the Linux side that's going to be running on our Cortex A, and then we have our Zephyr is going to be actually running on uh, the the zeroth kind of Cortex R MCU. And then we need to define again, like they call it an IPI within. Xilinx land, like that's essentially going to be our IPC communication. Um, and then the shared memory is uh, what we define as a shared memory for the IPC as well, right? So we're going to need to define those in our device tree. Um, this is again just kind of a, a block diagram showing from, from Xilinx's website, like how this sort of implementation works. So on the Linux side, we have essentially the same sort of open AMP infrastructure, uh, RPROC and RP message. And then underneath that is the vert IO kind of implementation. Uh, to serve as the implementation of these two uh, constructs. And then similarly on the Zephyr side, we're going to have kind of the same sort of thing. We have RP message, we're going to, and then because remote proc is only on the Linux side, we don't have that on the Zephyr side. Um, and then the vert IO is simply going to implement uh, the RP message on the Zephyr side. Um, so the goal is essentially we, we're going to create a, a Zephyr binary that's going to be resident, uh, that's targeted for the R5, and it's going to be resident on the A53 RFS. Um, we're going to load the firmware from the, the Petal Linux side, and then we're going to start it, and then essentially we're going to send a message from Linux to Zephyr, and the idea is that we should, uh, the, 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 the expectation is that we should get that message back uh, on the Linux side as well. Okay. Um, so how, do, how did I get started with this? So there's not a Digilent board in Zephyr at the moment, so I tried to find something that was close enough, and I found the uh, Korea KV260 R5 uh, board that is kind of present in Zephyr, and I used that as a starting point. And the first thing that I did was I wanted to make sure that uh, my pinouts were correct, uh, my clock configurations were correct, right, and I just got Blinky working, essentially. That's, that's generally uh, when I want to use a new board um, or new kind of processor, that's based on a, a, on a newer board, that, that's usually kind of the first step that I do is just get Blinky working. And it's not kind of sufficient to just like, yeah, you know, like just eyeball it and see that it's blinking like at one second, like you actually have to kind of generally like hook up like a scope and see, okay, you know, you know, maybe 110 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, et cetera. That gives you confidence that, okay, your clock configurations are correct. The next step is just to uh, get like you are working. So if you have hello world, that's higher confidence that your clock configurations are working because you are is a little bit more sensitive to kind of clock configurations, et cetera. So if your clock is off, you might be getting just garbled, you know, data that's coming out of your UART. Um, and so, you know, part of this exercise also was, and we'll see later on, is like getting the the, the Xilinx kind of tools like Vitus uh, working uh, with kind of Zephyr. So, you know, typically, typical flow is we have kind of debuggers. Um, debugger configurations that are part of Zephyr, and you can use command line or you can use like like uh, Nordic Connect, and then you have like a debugger built in. This is a little bit different because there's no native kind of Vitus support in Zephyr, so kind of had to like uh, get some like janky setup going and we'll kind of get to that, uh, like what that looked like a little bit, and then you know what the next steps are for that. And of course, the last step is to test, right? So once we have that working, uh, we needed to like or before this is once you have Blinky working, then we need to make the appropriate configuration and modifications um, to get that working with OpenAMP along with kind of the echo example uh, that's in kind of the, the Zephyr samples. 
So uh, on the Petal Linux side, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, we go through the Petal Linux configuration. Uh, it's not the kind of focus of this of this talk. So you know, all we need to do is en enable the remote proc uh, kernel modules and drivers uh, so that we have that capability uh, in, in Linux, essentially. And then this is something that I needed to do is to create uh, the recipe in Petal Linux to add the Zephyr binary. So the process was I'd build the binary. I mean, it was, it was pretty manual. Like you build the binary. Uh, the Zephyr binary, and then you kind of plop it down into your RFS uh, or your Petal Linux build, and then create your RFS and then load that um, on, on the Xilinx side and then kind of get going from there. So maybe there's opportunity here to kind of um, make this more integrated so that you have like a automated process where you can just build the Zephyr binary and then kicks off like a Petal Linux build to kind of Im embed that essentially. Um, and then you don't have to like do more manual steps. Um, and like I said, like this was... Uh, an important step to help me kind of debug uh, issues that I was running into is to use Vitus as a debugger. Um, and so it was pretty manual. Like I had to copy over a lot of the source files. There's like a bunch of different configuration steps in, in Vitus itself to kind of let it know like where the source files were, like where they were, how to set up the debugger itself, and then kind of reconcile uh, the symbols within the binary within the source files. But, you know, like it was painful, but at the end of the day, I, I got like a pretty nice debugger where I could debug uh, Zephyr code on a Xilinx kind of FPGA through their native kind of debugger, which is pretty nice. Um, so kind of, let's say, so once things kind of worked, started working well through the debugger, um, like how, how do we actually kind of load the, the binary and get it going, right? So it's pretty simple, right? You just, uh, because the, um, the binary is resident on like a known path in our, in our RFS, you just tell it like the, the, the file name without the extension. Uh, you just echo that to the sysfs entry and then you just echo start and it kind of kicks the tires and then once, and, and it was pretty pretty fascinating because because I had the, uh, the, the, the Vitus debugger set up, I could just set a breakpoint and then like once I hit start, you could actually see like the breakpoint in main kind of kicking like, okay, you know, this is actually kind of working. So it's pretty nice. Um, so, Kind of pivoting into some of the common issues that I encountered and, you know, could kind of share some of the lessons learned with you. Um, one of the first things that usually that, that did happen is just issues in loading and starting the firmware. So uh, the, the kernel module itself, like, again, if you don't have the appropriate entries uh, in your ELF file, it's going to throw an error. And one of the biggest reasons was um, you need to actually define um, this config option, like config open app. Uh, resource table is because uh, it 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 compiles essentially like resource table C has an explicit entry uh, for the resource table within um, within your linker essentially so then within your linker script and then it adds that to your final binary so um, that's kind of the one common issue that it, you know that I think a lot of people kind of run into um, that's important to kind of make sure that's part of your uh, your board uh, configuration. Um, the other thing was, um, and, and I see this kind of common as well, is like, okay, you got the, um, like your binary is running, right? You, you, can, you can use different mechanisms to confirm that your Zephyr binary is running. But now when you start to communicate from the Linux to the Zephyr side, you get a seg fault, right? So like, why does that happen? So a couple of things to make sure that you're doing before, um, to, to, to make sure that you're actually doing to ensure kind of this doesn't happen. One is, um, is your IPC connected to the mailbox in your DTS, right? So sometimes it's not, that's not necessarily like a seg fault. It's just like nothing happens, right? Like I have a breakpoint where I have a callback set uh, for where, when I get the message, but I, like it never triggers, right? Well, do you have your, your, um, your mailbox set up in to, to Zephyr IPC to make sure that that communication is being received on the Zephyr side? Um, you have to make sure that your SRAM, because in, um, the normal kind of KV260 uh, DTS file, the SRAM is not, it, it assumes like there is no other uh, coprocessor. It just assumes that that microcontroller is just by itself. And so you have to kind of update it to make sure that you're pointing it to the right um, memory location to actually point it to the, the RAM is in the right uh, kind of shared memory location that we saw kind of earlier. And then finally, um, did you conf did you make sure that your shared memory node is actually connected to your SRAM? So these are kind of the general three things that we need to make sure to ensure that we have kind of a successful uh, communication between the, to, the multiple processors. So 
this is kind of like a detailed example of like what that looks like. So this RPU Z, RPU zero IPI is the interface, and then uh, between uh, like this the IPC interface, which Xilinx calls IPI, um, and then here we can see like the mailbox that's essentially the the entry between uh, or the communication mechanism between the the Cortex A processor and the Cortex M zero. So this is the zeroth uh, MCU, um, and so all we need to do essentially is make sure that we enable that, and then in our uh, uh, overlay file just ensure that we're setting the Zephyr IPC node entry to a reference to that to this particular mailbox. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, is make sure that your, your SRAM location is correct. So the left is actually from Xilinx's kind of example on how they do um, uh, OpenAMP with free RTOS. So essentially, we need to make sure that we uh, specify these uh, RAM locations um, in our Zephyr DTS and update that node appropriately. And then again, we have to make sure that our Zephyr IPC shared memory node um, is points to the appropriate reference to like our SRAM node. And then you know the idea is that once you have these three uh, components kind of all correctly configured, then you should have communication between uh, the different coprocessors that are resident uh, on your on your silicon and on your system. Uh, so some of the next steps, uh, of course, like and I'm terrible at this. Um, is to upstream, right? So uh, add the board to like Zephyr, make sure it's there. You know, it's 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 a slight variation on the KB260, but again, I think having uh, as much board support in Zephyr uh, is pretty valuable. Um, and then, like I said, uh, you know, I think I think it would be helpful uh, for me to document the steps um, to get Vitus working uh, with Zephyr because I think that could be pretty powerful uh, tool for somebody else that's kind of using Zephyr with Xilinx products to be able to kind of step through uh, using Vitus. So I think I have about 10 minutes for questions or comments. Uh, yes, uh, we're at 12 minutes. Uh, th first of all, thank you, Mohammed, for your yep. presentation. Uh, do we have any initial questions? I see one up in the front first. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, if I remember correctly, with STM32 MP1, for instance, there were some concerns about um, OpenAMP and RP message throughput from the A7 to the M4. I think someone benchmarked it around 100K per second because it wasn't zero copy. Yeah. You're always, you know, managing this ring of shared buffers in SRAM. So if you want to do like zero copy transfers, is there some improvements that have happened and how that can be handled in OpenAMP, or is it better to just go below that and manage shared memory and signaling yourself? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't, like this was kind of just a purely functional test. Like I didn't actually uh, like under, like see like, okay, what the performance looked like. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it would be nice to see like where that limitation, if it, it limit, like where that like non-zero copy occurs across a different memory and then see like, hey, you know, is there, is there an opportunity to just improve OpenAMP? Um, and then, you know, maybe like Zephyr could be leading the way to improve like OpenAMP's uh, performance essentially. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so now you're booting the R core from the A core. Uh, you played around with the master function. So you first start Zephyr and then Zephyr starts your Linux kernel. So you have like, like a one second boot. That's a good point. Um, but like, how I, I guess so? You're assuming like that the that the firmware is like how, where would the Linux firmware and like RFS be resident? Like you would have to kind of figure out a way to like it would be resident in Flash, right? And then you would have to instruct like the Cortex A to like or would you? Like I, I don't, I guess I don't follow like what that. I'm, I'm implementing Open AMP with Zephyr on the 9.5, I mix 9.5, so there we can use the boot fuses to launch Zephyr from the QSPY. Right. And then the idea is to implement the mode proc the other way around. But as a stopgap right now, we just gonna boot first Linux and then the other way around. But the notion that you have this fast RTOS booting, doing your pin mixing, and then like 10 seconds, 20 seconds later, whatever, it depends on your Linux, right? That comes up later then. Right. I guess I'm just curious, like, how, like, are you triggering the Linux boot from Zephyr? 
Um, well, or is the, that the, the idea? The, the, that's the idea. Like, There's now is a different bare metal method for it, but uh -huh. I was just curious because I now saw this master. It's like, oh, hey, cool. Maybe someone made that already. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I mean, like, I like one of the. I mean, one of the things that like I was thinking about is like, okay, like if we kind of go back to like the the robot right that that I showed earlier like one of the things like okay while Linux is booting you could still kind of use um, the display interface to have Zephyr kind of display like a simple message so that okay while Linux is still booting you have something to kind of inform um, the the user like hey like what's going on but yeah that'd be interesting to see like how does because I mean if you're if you're on the same silicon right like powers you're getting power for both right so like how do you kind of stage it so that Linux boots after kind of Zephyr. So, yeah. And what would be, just out of curiosity, like where do you see that being like valuable? Um, so we're looking also at robotics. So the idea is that Linux is quality managed from mm -hmm. safety critical perspective. So that can die, that can reset, that can crash. So, and then the control loop is running on, on the Zephyr side. So especially that robot, it will trip over. Um, if you're gonna use Linux, if you have Zephyr, you have uptime, it, shouldn't fall over just you have power and you can run your safety critical or control loops got there. it well yeah cool that's yeah. just to mention here you can also start zephyr with remote proc from linux from uboot so they kind of they can start together but yeah i don't have an idea right now on how to start it from uh, zeph uh, linux to start from zephyr right. they can start together like from uboot of linux you can uh, with remote proc you can start the zephyr core I guess I guess it would be interesting to see like like maybe you can have a like an intermediary where you just have like U boot like just sit there and it's just waiting for like the remote proc from the Zephyr side to say like okay now boot right because the 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 firmware is already like it's there right it's resident on the flash so okay U boot is just sitting there waiting for uh, kind of and then like once Linux boots like okay the Zephyr side can can query like send a message and get a message back to see if it successfully booted or not yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a slight question or comment um, on OpenAMP, uh, the protocol there. Are the, um, the, 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 the messages fixed size? Um, I mean, I think they are. I think they're well-defined, so, yeah. Yeah, and so one of the challenges that we've run into is like, um, you, you, it's like you, you want a version of it that allows you to have flexible sizes for things like a network coprocessor sitting off on the... Uh, that you're using OpenAMP to discuss. And so we end up, uh, I'm saying we, my company, we end up with this, a custom version that's kind of close. And I, I'm not exactly sure why we didn't try to engage with the OpenAMP community to see if we can't get that up there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that, I'm not even remotely familiar with the, the underlying change they did there, but it was dynamic versus fixed was a problem for certain types of applications. Yeah, I had the same issue when I was talking yesterday about Vert.io, MMIO, that when you have that running underneath, you can run up a message on that, but that's fixed size and small units. But then on, next to it, you can expose a Vert.io network interface, for example. And then you use shared memory and uh, yeah, ne next to API message instead of on API message. Any more questions, guys? Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you.